company in conjunction with the U.S. military and Big Pharma. It looks like they're going to get a lot more pharmaceutical companies involved on the profit-making of this. They say that they're going to work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Welcome Trust. They're also arranging for production of ZMAP in animal cells. Right now, it's being produced in plant cells. They say, although that would take longer, it would allow for greater output by tapping into the biotechnology industry's huge production capacity. We're going with multiple manufacturers. Now, take a step back and remember that the ZMAP virus is something that is first developed by exposing mice to Ebola. Once they create some antibodies, they genetically modify those antibodies, then grow them in tobacco plants that are genetically modified. That creates what they call plantibodies that they then inject into the patients. So they directly put in quote unquote antibodies or plantibodies that are going to immediately confront the virus as opposed to waiting for the body to build up its own immune system. Now, is this effective? It may sound creepy, it may sound scary, and I have severe concerns about the safety of this, but let's look at the efficacy of this. Now, when we first heard about ZMAP, it was headlines like this in the mainstream media. Experimental drug likely saved Ebola patients. Now, those patients were the two Americans who were brought back to Emory University, Dr. Kent Brantley and another aid worker who was working with Samaritan's Purse. We were told, and this is the narrative that we see in the CNN story, on Thursday, Dr. Kent Brantley thought he was going to die. It was ninth day since the American missionary worker came down sick with Ebola in Liberia. Then they talk about the miraculous recovery that he went through when he was given the ZMAP vaccine. But there was also another thing that they gave him that some other outlets reported, Newsweek reported that on the same day, he got a blood transfusion. The headline there was the 20-year-old Ebola treatment that could save Kent Brantley. That actually preceded by a couple of days all the mainstream media accounts attributing the recovery to ZMAP. And what they have here is a quote from Franklin Graham, president of Samaritan's Percy, said, on Thursday, Brantley was given a shot at survival. A 14-year-old male Ebola patient who had been under Brantley's care and survived donated a unit of blood to Brantley, according to Samaritan's Purse. The young boy and his family wanted to be able to help the doctor that had saved his life. Well, that's very interesting because even though they recovered, they got the blood transfusion as well as ZMAP, we had two other patients who were given ZMAP that died. I don't know if they were given any other treatment. I don't know if they were given a blood transfusion. We still have three who were given the ZMAP vaccine, and it is unclear what their condition is at the moment. So if you just look at those numbers, and there were only seven treatments that were sent out before they ran out of supply of the ZMAP vaccine, it doesn't look like it's any better than what people are experiencing in terms of recovery rates without that vaccine. Since Dr. Brantley recovered, another American doctor, Dr. Richard Sacra, also came down with Ebola. He was given blood transfusion from Dr. Kent Brantley, who sent blood to him. They were both of the same type. And of course, for the blood transfusion to work, if you're going to have a transfusion that's going to grant you immunity, you need to have the same type of blood for a transfusion. But also, there are several different types of strains of Ebola. There's at least five strains of Ebola. It's not clear that if you have recovered from one strain of Ebola that it's going to give you immunity to the other strains. Nevertheless, this doctor was given a blood transfusion. So it raises the question, does Dr. Kent Brantley think that he was cured by ZMAP? Or does he think that he was cured by the blood transfusion? Well, actually, he says that he was cured by God. That's where he stands on this. But we have to look at this and question whether or not ZMAP has been proven to be effective. But that's not stopping the medical industrial complex from gearing up to make a lot of money off of this vaccine, perhaps making it mandatory. That's my concern. That's many people's concern. Now, Dr. Sacra is being treated in Nebraska, the Nebraska Medical Center. They are also giving him another experimental drug. They're not saying what it is. They say it is not ZMAP. And this is what the doctor there had to say. He said, we don't know if this is having an effect at all. We just administered everything that we had access to, honestly, and he's not going to name the drug because he doesn't want to mislead the public into thinking it's a cure. That's something we don't see happening from the other side. Stay with us right after the break. We're going to look at a money laundering case. It's going to shed some light as to how differently people are treated depending on the quantity of money that they launder. Seems like the more money you launder, 
the easier they are on you. Hello, everyone. I'm Darren McBreen, and here are some of today's top headlines breaking right now at Infowars.com. Experts say the Ebola virus can be transmitted at a distance from infected victims, and professors say health workers are being put at risk. In a piece published by SIDRAP, the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, authors Dr. Lisa Brosen and Dr. Rachel Jones highlight how Ebola currently has unclear modes of transportation. The U.S. Army says ISIS is planning to kill families of soldiers. The latest purported threat jacking up the temperature in the ISIS war abroad and the PSYOP propaganda battle at home is a claim by the Pentagon that the Islamic State is now targeting U.S. soldiers' families in America. Russia and Iran have agreed to use their own national currencies in bilateral trade transactions, and they will boycott the U.S. dollar. This is yet another reaction to to heavy Western sanctions placed on Russia by the United States. For more information on these stories, plus updates and breaking news as it happens, go to Infowars.com. This is Alex Jones for InfoWarsLife.com. The latest in preparedness is now here. An electrically stabilized colloidal silver solution that can be added to both your home cabinet and preparedness pack alike. Concentrated to 30 parts per million in what has been dubbed the Survival Silver Solution. The new InfoWars Life Silver Bullet Colloidal Silver is the answer for you and your family. And it's entirely free of toxic artificial additives that are loaded into many products. The InfoWars Life Silver Bullet Silver is so powerful that it is concentrated into a two ounce bottle and is not recommended for extended continual use. This is not a low grade formula. We are working with one of the top laboratory manufacturers in the United States to bring you the best form of colloidal silver using electrical processes within a base of deionized water. For your preparedness storage or your home kitchen, purchase your bottle of InfoWarsLife.com Silver Bullet Colloidal Silver today and find and other amazing supplements at InfoWarsLife.com. Introducing the first proprietary oxygen-based intestinal cleanser, OxyPowder, backed by FDA-approved phase one, two, and three clinical trials. All the toxins from the air, the food, the water, ultimately ends up in the gut or affects the gut. Take your health into your own hands and start cleansing your body today with OxyPowder. Secure your OxyPowder today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. HSBC was found guilty of laundering money by the billions for the drug trade. Of course, Eric Holder's Department of Justice essentially said they were too big to jail. No one went to jail and they got a very light fine. But if you're a former sheriff's deputy and you launder $40 million, not billions, you will go to jail for 12 years. That's what's happening to Robert Ricardo Maldonado, 49, worked as a cash runner for drug traffickers from 2001 until November 2013. Now, during this time, he was a sheriff's deputy. Then he was arrested with a million dollars in cash in the trunk of his car. And at the same time, he was running for elected office for constable. So you see, there's a huge difference. If you Launder a billion dollars, nothing happens to you. If you launder a million dollars, you go to jail for 12 years. What happens if you're just set up in the war on drugs? Remember that it was about a year ago that Eric Holder's Department of Justice was saying they were going to take a strong look at these mandatory minimum sentences that were being handed out to first-time offenders, sending people to jail for extremely long times. Of course, that has not happened. But let's look at what was brought to light at the time. This is an article from Think Progress. And they looked at five people who were serving draconian drug sentences thanks to the mandatory minimum laws. Those are the laws that were put in by the Reagan administration. Let's just look at the first one here. The man who sold his own pain pills to an informant. Now, this is a guy who was sentenced to 25 years mandatory minimum prison sentence. What did he do? Well, he sold some of his pain pills to an undercover informant who had become his friend and told him that he couldn't afford both his rent and prescription medication. So this guy, Horner, who works in a fast food restaurant, not making a lot of money, and a fa father, had been prescribed pain medication because of an injury when he lost an eye. Now, because he gives this guy some of his prescription pain pills, he is sent to jail for 25 years. 
The thing that makes this really egregious is the person who set him up, who befriended him, who told him the lies about how he couldn't pay his rent and pay for pain medication at the same time, was someone who had been convicted himself of a crime and was getting himself off by turning in somebody else. Let's take a look at one more. And of course, this is one that we talked about quite a bit. Someone who was in Montana operating a medical marijuana dispensary considered to be a model of compliance with state law. He was not breaking any state laws, but the feds came after him. What they did was they added a gun charge to his drug charge. They came after him for a large amount of marijuana, which he was doing legally according to state laws. They compounded that with a gun charge and set him up for 85 years. He would not take a plea bargain. Instead, he fought it in court. He lost, unfortunately, because I'm sure they had jurors who did not know about fully informed juries. They didn't know that they could judge the law as well as the facts of the case. They needed to judge the mandatory minimum laws. They needed to judge the federal laws that were coming in conflict with the state laws. But instead, they convicted him. The district court judge named Christensen was so outraged, they went back to the prosecutors and said, we need to adjust this. So the prosecutors took off the weapons charge, which means that he then only went to jail for five years. For five years for doing something that was entirely legal in the state of Montana, according to state law. This is where we are. This is the double standard. There is no equal protection under the law. There is no sanity to our war on drugs. And of course, that's where the war on our due process, on the Fourth Amendment, on so many different aspects that we have lost our constitutional rights. That is where this all began, far before the war on drugs. And of course, it has gotten much worse because we have not addressed those unconstitutional laws. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier in the program, Obama went to the CDC in the middle of September where he was giving us the all clear on Ebola. And at that very trip, he got onto an elevator with someone, private security, who had a gun and the Secret Service did not know about it. That supposedly is the straw that broke the camel's back and got the director of the Secret Service fired. But there were a lot of other missteps by the Secret Service recently. The door's not locked. Inside, an officer confronts Gonzalez but is overpowered. Alarm boxes are near the front door. They're silenced because the White House staff complained they were too noisy. You see these kind of cosmetic, you know, air quotes here, optics issues all the time. Well, we don't want to bother the president. We don't want to bother the ushers. Well, do you want to keep them alive? The director of the Secret Service has resigned. There have been multiple recent security breaches that have led up to this announcement. Besides the White House fence jumper who made it well beyond the front door, it's being reported that the final straw was that an armed private contractor shared an elevator with the president at CDC headquarters. But that's not to say that the Secret Service isn't working. The Fox brothers, who produced Conrad the Constitution, were visited by the service for making a cartoon that portrays the assassination of the president. Hey Chris, was I supposed to get the Colombian hookers tonight? I can't remember. Who knows nothing, Baldy? The brothers were eventually found not to be a threat. Also, when the president came to the LBJ Museum in Austin, InfoWars went in hopes of getting in a question. Even though we went through the process of getting credentialed, we were informed that we weren't selected by the service to attend the president's address. We couldn't even get within several hundred yards of the presidential convoy to get decent footage. This is security theater at its finest. Crack down on the media and keep the reporters at bay, but someone can literally waltz into the White House. You can find more reports at InfoWars.com. Well, that's it for tonight's news. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the Alex Jones channel. If you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, please consider becoming a subscriber and supporting our operation. You can share your subscription with others. 11 of you can watch each night as the news is broadcast, and you can also view all of Alex Jones's documentaries. We'll be back tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Join us. I began to get into iodine a few years ago because it was helping me and my family so much get healthy and detoxify. I believe our research is conclusive. This is the best iodine out there. And I know this for a fact, nobody else has got iodine 
based on these pure crystals, ladies and gentlemen. For a limited time, experience the ancient power of Survival Shield X2. Take advantage of this unprecedented 30% off super detail.